Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring retrocognition and reincarnation. My guest is Wagner Allegretti, who is the co-founder with Nancy Trivellato of the International Academy of Consciousness. They have a beautiful campus in Portugal. Wagner is originally Brazilian. He is author of Retrocognitions, an investigation of the memories of past lives and the periods between lives. Welcome, Wagner. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. It's, it's very interesting to me how your work really began as an exploration of the out-of-body experience and the human energy, the subtle energy systems associated with out-of-body travel, but it led you into an investigation of Indeed. reincarnation. Yes. And in fact, one of the reasons for that, it's a kind of interesting thing, is that retrocognition was the kind of phenomenon that I had not experienced before. So I had my spontaneous out-of-body experiences and sometimes some remote viewings. And I many times heard people discussing, talking about their retrocognitions, and that got me really curious. Why haven't I never had any kind of experience like that? So then I started studying and reading and applying techniques to see if I could have my own. So then I start having some of those experiences. After creating, I think, the right conditions, some of them uh, happened spontaneously. And it is interesting that some people, some mediums, some psychic people, they also told me about some of my past lives without knowing anything about my own experiences. And some of their accounts coincided precisely with the memories that I got on my own. Well, you've already raised a very interesting point, which is the supposition, and, and I think in your case it's been proven out, that an adult human being without resorting to past life therapy or hypnosis is capable of accessing retrocognitive information, including past lives. Indeed, indeed. As with everything else, we know that some people are naturally more predisposed to have these kind of retrocognitions, but like uh, working with energy or like leaving the body, if we know techniques, if we apply some time, some discipline, we can have our own experiences. The way I used to see or to understand this is that retrocognition can be a very powerful tool for therapy, for instance, if some people have some traumas or some uh, phobias and things like that. So in these cases, many times hypnosis, those forms of therapy can be really indicator could be positive. But if we think the way I think that recognition is a very powerful tool, a way of exploring ourselves, our identity, memories, our past, we cannot rely on someone else to keep doing these regressions throughout our life. So we have to have the means on our hands by ourselves. And I think and I know this is definitely possible. You engaged in a study including your own personal experiences and I'm assuming the experiences of students. And the students also, yes, because I started giving a course about this many, many, many years ago. So people would come to learn the techniques and many times they would share their own experiences and I compiled a lot of those results. And friends discussing this because I joined this kind of groups into the psych, you know, the paranormal spirituality, you know, a long time ago. And it was very common for people to tell their stories. And then also, of course, many books where people discuss their own experiences. And I could start seeing like patterns if you could classify different experiences. That's why one of the chapters in my book is exactly the classification of these retrocognitions. Like, for instance, some are spontaneous. Others are provoked by an external source, like the therapist. Some can be provoked by the person himself or herself. Some experiences are more emotional. Others are more intellectual, more of ideas. Some experiences are positive, even if it can be a little bit hard for a while. But some retrocognitions sometimes take the person out of a point of balance so they can put a person confused for some time. So there are many different ways of classifying these experiences. And uh, 
certainly could see that some factors, natural factors, can predispose someone to retrocognitions, like the hypnagogic state, mm -hmm. dreams, sleep. But some other factors that we can control can also facilitate retrocognitions, like even leaving the body. Mm -hmm. Because the memories that we have of past lives, they are not in our physical brain. The physical brain does not contain those memories because it didn't exist at the time. So these memories, they have to be somewhere else. And we think is basically the first level of access to them is our uh, spiritual body, mm -hmm. psychosoma, the astral body. Yeah. So when we are out of the body in a normal OB, it's much easier for us to access those memories. So provoking OBs is one of the ways of facilitating those out of body experiences. Something else. When we were talking before about chakras, and we have these chakras in our head, these chakras are very important because they work like an interface between our power brain, the brain of this astral body, and the physical brain. But most of the people have these chakras not so well developed. I could even dare to say it's they are a little bit atrophied mm -hmm. because of lack of use. So some techniques with energy, like velo, moving energy up and down, triggering by will, our vibrational state, they can make these chakras get more and more active. Let's define velo uh, for yes. our, our viewers since you've used the term. Yeah. We call it voluntary energy longitudinal oscillation. Translating this, by our will, we move energy you know, up and down inside of our body. Little by little, we speed it up, getting faster and faster. So when we reach enough speed and enough... Uh, free volume of this energy moving, we trigger this state that is called vibrational state. Oh, Robert Moreau discussed a lot about this vibrational state and Muldoon and Kruko, people who studied out about experiences. So when we get this vibrational state, it makes the communication between this power brain, the brain of this other set of body we have, and the physical brain. Yes. And this facilitates the Recognition, And I noticed this because many times in my life, I woke up in the morning without remembering anything special about that particular night. So I thought, well, let me do my first energy work of the day, just to start the day with as much energy as possible. And then, just there on my bed, I start moving energy little by little, exactly as I just described. And then more and more, when I got the vibrational state, suddenly... I remembered an OBE that I just had during that night. Oh. So if I had not done that energy exercise, I would never remember that particular OBE. State-specific memory. So in this case of my example, I remembered that particular OBE that just happened. Yes. But sometimes when people enter into longer sessions of this energy work, you could even think of this as being a state of energy mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Because mindfulness is something very old, of course, but nowadays people are more aware yes. of it. So people focus their attention on their breathing, some sounds of the environment, but we can do the same and we think at a much deeper level when we start sensing our own energy. So we focus our attention on our energy. When you are moving your energies up and down, this absorbs your focus, your attention so much that many times helps you to create some, uh, in lack of a better word, out altered states of consciousness. But altered, it's a kind of loaded word because sometimes when we say altered, people think it is by drugs, you know, mm -hmm. psilocybin or something like this. But no, the consciousness can have many different modes of functioning. So getting into the vibrational state, in fact, changes our state of consciousness. So this helps us to access deeper memories, memories that we don't usually access. And you're also very interested in the, it's sometimes called the intermission period, intermission, the state yes. between incarnations. Yes. It is interesting because in my courses, when I teach about this, I say, look, we should try to remember our past lives, to know exactly what we should not be doing, we should not be repeating here now. And we should remember our last intermissive period, or the period between lives, to know what we should be doing here. Because many of us, when we were during that period, we were lucid, you no, know, intelligent, we were you no, know, conscious enough to think about our past, 
to see what we need to learn, to develop, and we could plan the life we are having now. And this is a kind of planning that we don't do alone. We do with other people, people that we are going to meet, perhaps your future wife, perhaps your parents. So because our evolution doesn't happen, you know, separate, isolated from others. Mm -hmm. So our life missions, in fact, they overlap. There is our particular individual life mission, but this has to be coherent with the life mission of people around of us. So when we remember these intermissive periods, many times we know what we trained for, what we planned, because this planning is not only writing in a you know, kind of paper what we are going to do. The book of life. Exactly. But we are prepared for that. Yeah. And the analogy that I use in my course is it's exactly like when NASA is preparing astronauts for the next space mission. Suppose when now, in a few years, when we go to Mars, yes. they have to get a big group of people, teach them a lot of uh, theoretical things, but a lot of practical situations, simulating problems until they are ready enough to be put on that kind of yes. challenge mm -hmm. is the same thing. Because I remember, and this is one of my most remarkable experience of recognition, I remember when I was in this period between lives before the mm -hmm. conception of this body, and I was thinking about the body, oh sorry, about the life that I was about to start. Yes. I remember my state of mind. I had the vision of everything that I should do, the complexity of it, the challenges, and so many people involved. I had a kind of a little form of expectation, a little bit of anxiety with that, but not in the pathological sense, because I was seeing the complexity of so many people, so many resources, and I could see how smart these other higher consciousnesses, they have to be, to put so many people taking the best of the, their resources, their strong traits and weak traits, mm -hmm. to help them, and myself, of course, to develop individually as you know, much as possible, mm -hmm. but also the way we can help others, because we evolve helping others to evolve. Well, it's, it seems as if you're implying that in addition to planning a past life in conjunction with other people, there are higher guides or yes. uh, spirits, higher consciousness uh, uh, available with an even vaster perspective than than you would have in an out-of-body state. Absolutely. Absolutely. For me, this is a fact because many times when I leave and left my body, I met some of these helpers, mentors, spiritual guides. Many people use different names. They are people like us. They are, in most of the case, not all human consciousnesses, but a few steps ahead in this evolution. They are less emotional. They are much smarter. They are more cosmoethical. Mm -hmm. They have a much better view of the consequences of the actions or even of the omissions. Yeah. So many times I see them as being strategists, thinking of so many different needs, opportunities, situations, and how to make the best of it. What is interesting is that they know, and we know also because of them, that many things cannot be accomplished in a single life. Mm -hmm. So there is a much bigger plan. Okay, let's get this group, this evolutionary group, as we call it, to accomplish this in 20 lives could be about 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Suppose, for instance, if we think, okay, let us end war in this planet. How many lifetimes <laughs> would take? That might 100,000 years? Well, yeah, more than 20 <laughs> lifetimes. I yes, think. exactly. Yeah. So, in the case of uh, my evolutionary group, the main point of this group life mission is to tell people, to clarify people, to help them to find by themselves they are not the physical body. They are multidimensional consciousnesses. We are beyond space and time and shape and gender, everything. But certainly, we need these vehicles, these automata, <laughs> these androids, to be able to interact with this dimension here. Mm -hmm. And this requires a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. So we are not just like you know, a fish that is born in the middle of the ocean, lives as much as possible and dies. We are going to have a family. And many times, a lot of these people in our family, they were with us together in past lives, sometimes with very good karma, very good connections, 
but sometimes with some <laughs> links that are not so easy. Yeah. So we have a second chance to fix some of these things. Mm -hmm. So in the way we try to organize this, we have this idea of the ego karma, the personal karma, mm -hmm. the whole set of actions and reactions of past lives that brought us here. So we have uh, strong points and weak points there. So part of our life mission is to improve our ego karma. But for most of the people, the challenge is in the group karma. So all the lovers we had in past lives, the people we killed, the people who killed us, people we helped. Mm -hmm. So now we see the context yes. of the group we are part of. But also there is this kind of uh, more universal karma. That is our position, our opportunity to help a much bigger community. So is the, whole, the rest of the whole of humanity, but also, also not, not only the humanity, but even Earth, the ecosystem. Because now we are killing a lot of plants and animals. We are at least allowing you know, a lot of extinction now. So what is going to be our karma? And I used to give this many times as an example in some of my speeches. I say, look, let us be very selfish, okay? So what is the kind of planet you would like to find yourself in next life? Eden, idyllic, or a dystopian wasteland? So we are going to face the karma of what we are doing with our planet now. Next life, let us see if we can get the best. <laughs> I mean, it seems as if uh, at this moment in time, our, our, we were 50-50 planet. There are many, many beautiful, idyllic, uh, paradise-like places on the planet sure, still, yes, yes. and and many places that are very desolate and dystopian. Oh yes, yes, and some have a good perspective of staying kind of okay, but others, I think, some places are already beyond hope. So perhaps it is going to take a few thousands of years for some places to recover. And with this climate change. We really don't know if we are going to have some chain reactions, things getting out of control. So as you know, if the ice melts, you know, the soil gets darker and then absorbs more heat from the sun. We really don't know. But I think that as more active, the more conscious consciousness is in this planet, we have a kind of a responsibility obligation with the rest. I mean, with the rest of the species, the rest of the animals. And this is part of that universal karma there. Mm -hmm. So the way I see red cognition, like the Autobot experience, is a very good tool to help us to become more lucid, to know more about ourselves. Can you imagine, for instance, if a person, let me give you just one example, a person who is very, you know, macho, machistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. If that person remembers a past life when he was a woman, mm -hmm. abused, mm -hmm. 10 children, you know, mm -hmm. and having a very difficult life, how would that person change now just by remembering that? Imagine a very racist, racist person now remembering a particular life when the person was part of a minority, mm -hmm. was a slave, mm -hmm. I don't know, perhaps in Greece, in, you know, in Egypt. Now the person is going to see things differently. I think one of the problems we have in life is that people lack references. We are born this way in a particular family, and then our spectrum of experience is a very small one. But one or when we remember many lives, we have a much bigger set of experience to base ourselves on. So then our priorities, our sense of ethics, they change with that. Many times we, th we think like this, oh, if I could go back when I was a teenager, if I could go back there, but with the maturity, the experience that I have now, how many things would be different? They would do differently, yeah. But we can do the opposite. We can remember our past mistakes, experiences of so many different lives to improve the way we are now. Well, one of the points you seem to be addressing is the idea of a soul group. Yes. That, and I get the sense from uh, how you speak that you sense yourself as part of a soul group that has a mission well beyond one lifetime. Perfect. 
Perfectly. And we see this because what we notice is that people evolve in groups, changing roles. So today I'm the father of my son, but perhaps in a past life he was my father, my friend. We keep rolling, changing, you know, uh, places there, but basically evolving a group. We call this, just to simplify, a kind of a spiritual family. Mm -hmm. So many times when these people die and then they meet in the extra physical, as we say, they get together by affinity. There we have the best of our friends, but also the worst of our enemies. <laughs> enemies are part of this kind of oh, karmic group also. Uh -huh. So certainly this group expands over time yeah. because throughout, for instance, medieval times, our circle of relations was very small. But nowadays, mm -hmm. in a week, we can see more people than we saw and met throughout our whole life during medieval times. Nowadays, with internet, with mm -hmm. Zoom, with, with streaming and so many courses, this was completely blown out of proportion. This is sci-fi for the consciousness. And this is going to, only going to get more complex. So what we see is that these very small groups, they are expanding, expanding to the point this spiritual family is becoming the whole. Mm -hmm. It's become, at least to simplify, the whole of humanity. Yes. But a lot of things are getting more and more complex. So if we think of us in the last 10,000 years since the agricultural revolution, because we were nomads, mm -hmm. hunters, gatherers for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, we had a particular way of living. It was very simple. Mm -hmm. well, getting food, moving around. But once we had the agricultural revolution, that changed us. Mm -hmm. Because then we stayed in a particular place, and then we start having the idea of a property, yes. memory. Yeah. Oh, my grandfather was born in that place. This happened there. So there was this accumulation of knowledge. This changed us a lot. And it has been like that for 10,000 years. But now we are facing so many changes and so fast. And we have to adapt. Yeah. And human beings are very slow to adapt. And one thing that I have noticed that is very interesting, even in terms of uh, uh, philosophical point of view, is that in the past we have we had very little space for our for our free will. Mm -hmm. We ate the food that was available. We would basically inherit the profession, the abilities of our of our father or mother. Mm -hmm. If we were lucky enough, we would inherit some land there. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to decide. We just went with the flow. Yeah. But nowadays I see a lot of people, some of those many times come to me for these personal sessions, and they are lost. They have so many possibilities, space for decision, they feel confused. And they enter into, into a state of uh, agitation, anxiety, depression, because they don't know what to do. The supermarket of possibilities now mm -hmm. is too big for a monkey brain <laughs> to disentangle. And, and of course, there are professions that exist today that never existed in the, I mean, Absolutely. what you do, for example, is entirely Absolutely. unique. Exactly, exactly. And some professions, they disappeared completely. Mm -hmm. You know, a shoemaker basically disappeared. You know, a, a chimney cleaner, no, doesn't exist anymore. And now with AI, my goodness, <laughs> let us see how adaptable we can be. I think there are levels of reality, and reality can be very different depending on which level you're focusing on. So at one level, the mystics will say, we are one with everything. I like that level to be that sort of the foundation yes. of reality, one one with everything. But if we're talking reincarnation, that's a very different level. You're not one with everything. You're one with a particular sequence of lifetimes. Yes, there is this sense of identity. I think that deep, deep, deep down there, we are all connected. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we are just expressions of a different no huge cosmic consciousness. Yes. But in practical terms, we are individuals. Mm -hmm. We have our own stories. We have memories of many lives. And this can go throughout many thousands of years. Yes. And we have this very strong sense of identity. And some models, some theories, they say that this bigger consciousness evolves through this individuation, this kind of... Uh, 
personalized experience of so many different possibilities. Makes sense to me. Yes, because we can expand the spectrum of possibilities there. Yeah. One person is very creative. The other one is very analytical. One person, for instance, deals mostly with the physical body and action. other one more with the intellect. Mm -hmm. And I think this diversity of manifestations is important to all of us. Mm -hmm. But for practical, pragmatic, you know, uses terms, I think that we are very much individualized mm -hmm. because we see that when people die, they go to other dimensions and they are still basically the same person. I met my grandfather who died many years ago. He was a lot younger, looking younger, mm -hmm. different face, but the identity, the type of energy, the energy signature was exactly the same. And I could identify him. He remembered me. Mm -hmm. I met my son before he was conceived. And this is one of the most remarkable out of experiences I had. I left my body when I was still living in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I went to the living room and I saw this toddler, this young boy there, smiling at me. And I thought, who is this guy? What is this spirit entity doing here? Yeah. When I get, got closer to him, he opened his arm like inviting mm -hmm. me to hug him. Mm -hmm. I say, well, when I held him, hugged him, I felt a very strong sensation of uh, knowing him, familiarity, love, affection. I thought, who is this guy? And then suddenly I got this kind of telepathy or this intuition that I was going to be his father. The surprise made me return to my body. <laughs> and I woke up, sat there by the edge of of the bed for a long time, thinking. I didn't see, didn't say anything about that to my first wife, but I knew we were going to be parents. Mm -hmm. After a while, we got a confirmation that she was pregnant. And then I told her, it's going to be a boy, it's going to be blonde, it's going to have this behavior, described a lot of things about him. So as he grew, I could see exactly him the way he was mm -hmm. just before being conceived. I'm very interested in the hug that that you had because now you're out of your body, yeah. but you, I think the term that you use is parabody. Parabody, yes. Uh huh. What happens is when we go to other dimensions, sometimes we have our psychosome or parabody very dense, almost physical. In other experiences, we can be lighter, lighter. So there are many different dimensions. Sometimes you go to dimensions, they are almost like immaterial. Mm -hmm. And your psychosomal power body has to be compatible with that. Yeah. But in that case, because I was close to my physical body, so it was a, di a distance of a few you know, yards from mm -hmm. my, my bedroom there, and per perhaps because I was very dense at the time, and uh, that spirit who was going to become my son was already in the process of densifying, being ready, prepared to be born. Mm -hmm. So we were like uh, compatible so I could touch him, I could feel the hug. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we leave the body, suppose you meet another consciousness who is much more subtle. Sometimes you can pass even your power arm through it, mm -hmm. because it is in a slightly different dimension there. Mm -hmm. And this is, in fact, one of the most interesting things in terms of the, of the OBE. I'm very much intrigued by this idea of the dimensions, because there are so many different realities and they coexist. Yeah. They, they interpenetrate themselves without interfering too much with each other. Mm -hmm. It's not only in terms of uh, vibration or energy. There is some kind of different geometry also, mm -hmm. because sometimes I got out of my body and it was difficult to visually interpret what I was seeing. Because, uh, for instance, perspective, parallax, all this visual interpretation that the, the brain does was, was different. The you whole geometry is yes, different. Yes, you see a road, it remains parallel all the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't converge. Mm -hmm. So it's different. So it's like a kid who is learning how to interpret senses and vision and distance. Many times we are outside of the body, yeah. <laughs> learning how to adapt to those that we call para-perceptions, perceptions beyond the physical ones. Uh, you've also used the term, if I recall correctly, energy coupling. Energy coupling. That uh, sometimes you, you may couple with another individual to the extent that you feel yourself being that person. And it doesn't mean it was a past life of yours. 
Exactly. This kind of energy coupling can happen many times spontaneously. Some people are very sensitive. They can get close to a person and then after a while they can feel anxious if the person is anxious. They can feel, for instance, a headache if the person has a headache or is prone to it. This can be done intentionally because when you transmit energy to someone, the two auras, they can fuse for a while. That, the, that's the energy coupling or auric coupling. Mm -hmm. When we have this level of coupling, many times you can read the person. Physical sensations, a, li a little bit about emotions of the person. But in some cases, like it happened to me, I got some level of access to the memories of that person. Mm -hmm. In some cases, I could confirm because I described to the person, look, I saw a scene like this, this, and that, and the person describes, oh, yes, this happened when I was very young. Sometimes some people told me, oh, yes, this is one of the previous past lives that I had. Mm -hmm. Someone described exactly that same thing to me. But when I see this, I feel and I see them as being external to me. Mm -hmm. It's not my own memory. Mm -hmm. It's like you watch a movie, you see a lot of things, but you know those were not your own experiences. Yeah. There is a difference of uh, quality, mm -hmm. of uh, identification there. But certainly, this is a very important thing. Because many times people have, during their hypnagogic office state, some spontaneous images there, and they immediately think, assume those were recognitions. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful with that. Because we can read a book, we can watch a movie, and then we go to sleep, and our dreams might be influenced by those inputs that we had. Yes. So then what I say and have there in my book is we have to wait, we have to be careful, we have to accumulate enough data information to be sure we had that particular life. So I have some notes, my own you know, reports there of experiences that, that I had, mm -hmm. but the, I still do not assume, don't take them as being past life recollections. Yes. I have there you know, experience to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. But sometimes a particular memory comes back and again, different parts of it, like pieces of a puzzle, and they fit neatly, exactly together. And then you can see more and more, and this thing is coherent. And many times explains a lot of things of your present life. You can find there the consciousness who is now your father, mm -hmm. your spouse, your kid. You can see, ah, this is why I have this particular trait this behavior. Mm -hmm. So things match perfectly, but we have to be patient. I have seen a lot of people who have one single little fragmented experience and they say, okay, I was there in Egypt, I was a, a pharaoh, yeah. <laughs> whatever. I would imagine that there are gray areas, like uh, how do you distinguish between, for example, a, a spiritual guide and a past life figure? The spiritual guide is something that, you, that you're perceiving the now. Mm -hmm. So I use this expression, retrocognition, yeah. you know, to know something from the past. There is the simulcognition, to know, to be aware of the present moment. You are living now, mm -hmm. a simulcognition. Yes. We are aware, perceiving, thinking about this we, we are here now. You are here now, and we are sure of that, or mm -hmm. we should. <laughs> but also we can have a precognition. Mm -hmm. We can know something before it happens. Yes. And I had a few of those. Very, very interesting. So this shows that the consciousness is, so, is not so much limited by time. Yeah. So when I perceive, I feel a helper, I feel, or a spiritual guide, I feel as something happening now. Mm -hmm. Many times it's like someone coming, entering, passing through the door. I know the person is here. Yeah. You can talk. You can discuss things there. But when you have a retrocognition, it's basically remembering something. You don't change that. Mm -hmm. But some of our retrocognitions, they can be so full. They can be so thorough, so complete, that you feel almost like if you were having a, a time travel. Because instead of seeing things from the outside, because some of our recognitions are like this. You feel here and you are watching something like in a screen right. out of you. That's right. But sometimes you feel back immersed yes. into that context. Mm -hmm. You can feel the pleasure, the pain, the thoughts, the emotions of that time. And we feel like if we were a kind of a double consciousness, the one, the real one, observing all of that. And the thoughts, the, the thought process of that time, yeah. it's almost like if you were possessing someone. <laughs> but we know it was us. Yeah. 
So some people, when they discuss, study red cognitions, they think it's a real time travel. Yeah. What was the name of the, that movie? Uh, Christopher Reeves uh, was Somewhere in Time. I don't know if you watched that movie. No, I don't. Christopher Reeves, Somewhere in Time. This is mm -hmm. now almost 30 years old. Mm -hmm. But it was exactly a movie like that. Because that guy learned from a book how to provoke, a, uh, sorry, a red cognition. Mm -hmm. So he dressed like people used to dress in the mm -hmm. past. So he put a tape recorder there with a message to induce that state until he really felt himself in the past. Mm -hmm. But then he came back by the end. So not <laughs> in any... Didn't get procedure. lost. <laughs> but it's very interesting, a very beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. With uh, Jane Seymour, yes, so somewhere in time. I'll have to watch it. Yes. But, uh, of course, you've now raised a fascinating issue. I of, hope so. Uh, the issue of, I would I call it um, the paranormal time travel. You don't need a machine. Yes. You can, uh, your mind, the human mind in its vast infinity can go anywhere in time and space. Yes. It's true. And uh, sometimes we don't know how to do that. Yeah. We don't have a particular dial that we can tune so precisely, but we can use some tricks. For instance, I have been to places like ruins of some ancient civilizations. Like, for instance, once I was close to Seville, and mm -hmm. there is a big, huge Roman you know, sight there, mm -hmm. even with the kind of Colosseum there. Now you're talking about being there physically. Physically, yes. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a whole afternoon there. I sat there on those you know, stones, I closed my eyes, and then I start pumping, sending, emitting energy. If you will, like tentacles connecting to everything, I was trying to do like a kind of psychometry mm -hmm. of the place. And then what happens is that many times people have recognitions at that very moment. Mm -hmm. I didn't have at that moment. But when I went back to the hotel during the night, I had a recognition. Mm -hmm. So all those memories, they came back. So now, when you call them memories, what, are you referring to memories of a past life or just one, one of my past lives there because I was in the context? But sometimes people access a memory that is not theirs. Yes. You know, look, this is a memory of the place, mm -hmm. of the space. Mm -hmm. But sometimes places can really trigger this. Do you know what is interesting? A very interesting experience. In one of our trips to Japan, Nance and I were in Kyoto. And we like very much to walk around. We don't take taxis or <laughs> the tube. We were exploring those little straight alleys. And we enter a very particular old part of the town there. Both of us stopped in a corner there, stayed there silent for a while. And then we continued walking. And then we talked to each other. Look, at that corner, I had this very strong perception of familiarity with that place. I saw a scene of us being here. And what happens is that she had the same thing, mm -hmm. same time, mm -hmm. same place, yeah. the same corner. Yeah. So many times this help us to think, look, this is not only my imagination. Why this would happen only there, both of us? Because I could have this kind of impression in one place. Nancy could have this in some other place. And many times we had this. Mm -hmm. Once we were in a castle close to Madrid, uh, a very beautiful city called Segovia. Mm -hmm. They have a beautiful castle there. Nancy and I had the same thing in the same room. We, because you go passing through many different rooms in the castle there. In one of those, we had something later on. We said, ask each other, what did you feel in that room there? This, this, and that. Coincided completely with what I felt. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's interesting that you, you access memories of others external to you, but sometimes they trigger also your own memories mm -hmm. if you had experiences there before. Imagine, for instance, a, an archaeologist using this. And you been, told me. And you told me that someone has done it. It's been done a few times. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I have to study this. Mm -hmm. Imagine if more people could do this. Yes. We know so little about some particular sites, mm -hmm. because there is lack of, uh, you know, documents or artifacts. Yes. Imagine getting there a group of people tuning in, doing the auric or energy coupling there. Yes. And then you give people enough time. And then independently, these people write yeah. what they per perceive without influencing each other. 
And then you could see what is the common denominator of those experiences there. Well, I think that the conventional wisdom within the professional parapsychology community is that the um, clairvoyant or retrocognitive abilities at that level are very rare. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm yeah. under the impression that you, you you train so many people that this is a trainable ability. It, it, it could be much more widespread if there were more social support networks. Absolutely. And without torturing people, without waterboarding them, without getting people close to the brink, the limit of uh, no, life and death. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the key for that is the energy work. Mm -hmm. Part of that is a little bit more obvious, like deep relaxation. Most of the people don't know how to relax. They do not relax or they take too long. Mm -hmm. So for you to go to a historical site, sometimes you just stay there, close your eyes, and you have to do a kind of a abstraction from other distractions of your life, and then you tune in with time. You can do this quickly. Mm -hmm. But then the energy work is important there. And so I would say even it's so easy. Mm -hmm. It would be much easier if we could start learning this very early in our life. Imagine if or when our society can start teaching, training young kids to do this. You get the kids, oh, let us feel the energy of this beautiful tree mm -hmm. and this other one here. Here, Oh, this bit bolder, this rock here, let us feel if we could grow with this. And let me tell you something that I think it is interesting. When you start studying retrocognitions and thinking, I love this, you start thinking about your future lives. Mm -hmm. And then we think, am I able to plan my future life? Up to a certain point, we can do some level of preparation for that. So, for instance, within my possibilities, I think, look, if I can, one of the things I would like to have in my future life, because for me it doesn't matter which country I'm going to find myself mm -hmm. in, money or not, really, I don't care about those things. But... I would like very much to have both parents who are conscious projectors, mm -hmm. people with OBs. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if in you, if you are a toddler there in the morning eating your cereal and mom and dad are discussing, talking about their out of experiences. Yes. Oh, I met grandpa. Oh, I did this. I did this extra physical rescue. I went to this other planet and we are there <laughs> eating. <laughs> people think kids are stupid. They are so smart. Suppose if we could grow already with this as something being natural, yes. we could create a completely different society with that. Our level of cosmoethics would be completely, absolutely different. Cosmoethics. Cosmoethics, a, a word that I love. Yeah. It communicates so much. It's a self-explanatory word. Mm -hmm. Because our sense of ethics is pretty much based on what? Our culture, the experience that we had, sometimes even the ecological conditions, yeah. because uh, native Indians there in the Amazon, they go up and down naked, and mm -hmm. that is not a problem. Yeah. You cannot do this in the desert. You cannot <laughs> do this in the Arctic. Yeah. So what is right or wrong depends on each case. Mm -hmm. There are so many rules for food, what you should eat, should not eat, mm -hmm. and many times they become part of the scriptures there. Yeah because of the conditions people had in the past. Mm -hmm. But then when you expand your palette of experiences in other dimensions, you had other principles, and then you start revising some of the ethical principles that we have here. And we, we need a lot of that. Mm -hmm. We are still too much of a tribe of uh, you know primitive primates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if our people like to hear that, but I think it's a little exercise of a self, you know, self-criticism. I mean, we're so embedded in human civilization with all of the technology around us. It's hard for people to understand that you go back just a few thousand years uh, or um, even in geological time, a very, if it were a million years, that's a very tiny exactly. amount of time in terms of the history of the planet. Yes. And uh, human beings, if to the extent that they existed, it wasn't Homo sapiens at, at that time. It was our earlier Homo erectus exactly. ancestors. Yes, yes. Basically, living one step above the other animals in the Serengeti plain. 
Absolutely. Like the case of Lucy yeah. and, uh, you know, her kind, yes. Imagine remembering that time. Mm -hmm. I never had any kind of uh, recognition that far in time, yeah. but I think it is possible. One thing that makes us think a lot about this is, in the past, we had very few human beings. So we cannot say that all of us were there at this very ancient times. Right. Population is growing, growing, growing. So there is a new influx of consciousness is coming here from other planets. So some of us have been here since Lucy's time, mm -hmm. but some have arrived here more recently. So even when we think of the overall karma with the planet, with the human civilization, some people are more involved. Mm -hmm. They have a much longer, you know, how could they say least? Now, what you're things. saying makes perfect sense to me, but how do you derive that knowledge? You mean in terms of consciousness coming from other planets? Yes. Yeah. Where, where does that information come to you from? Well, in part because many times I was outside of my body and I met those people who could call aliens. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very different from the way we are here. Yes. But in terms of the level of consciousness, lucidity, they were basically like us. Mm -hmm. So communicating, exchanging ideas. And they told the stories of being in other planets. Mm -hmm. And life was ending at those planets. So population was reducing, reducing, even by natural reasons. Mm -hmm. So they were preparing to start to reincarnate here. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much like a, an invasion in the sense of the sci-fi movies that we see, but with their psychosoma, astral body, that power body was compatible with the kind of genetics they had there. Mm -hmm. So they needed time to reconform, adjust their psychosoma or astral body to start having lives here like us. Mm -hmm. And this takes some time. And some of these people, they told me and told others, look, some of my people are already here in this planet, reincarnated. You know, for you know, a few decades, a few hundred years, you no know, earlier. But those that I that I met were in the process of reincarnating here, and for you no, know, as a deduction, even by what they say, we think: look, there is always a kind of a new influx, if we could use this this expression, injection of new blood. This is good because this helps our. Society to have uh, people with new ideas, mm -hmm. new approaches. We don't know how much of uh, no Renaissance or the Industrial Revolution could be part of this. New ideas, new consciousnesses with new skills coming, helping us to get this you know <laughs> primate tribe <laughs> a little bit higher and higher. Well, you were a scientist. You you have a, an education in electrical engineering. Yes. You've done laboratory research. We've reported on the fascinating work you've done with the fMRI. Exactly. But if I were to try to verify what you've just told me now about your conversations with alien beings while you are out of the body, Definitely. I would have to basically take your training program so I could repeat it myself. Exactly. I, I'm very much in favor of any effort to try to find objective, objective evidences for all of this. But some things are really, really difficult. Just as you said, how can I, can I prove that I had these contacts with some of these alien extraphysical consciousnesses? Mm -hmm. In their period between lives, very difficult. Yeah. At least with the kind of technology we have nowadays. But as you just said, but we can help people to develop their abilities, to have these experiences. And once you have your, your own experience of that, mm -hmm. we can talk about it. But we don't need to go that far. So far, we don't have any kind of technology that can prove people dream. We know that our brain waves change, yeah. of course. But, but there is no machine to put in a video the kind of experience that is very internal, yeah. subjective, that we had with a dream. That's right. And even if this is kind of possible nowadays, for a long, long time, there was no way of proving dreams existed. But we could talk about, because most of the people dream. Yeah. So I cannot prove mine. You cannot prove yours. But we can talk about because we have the similar kind of experiences. Yes. I think we can do the same with 
out of our experiences. And what is interesting, many times, not so common, but it's possible, people have uh, joint projections. People leave their bodies, they meet outside, the, uh, outside of the body, mm -hmm. they return to their bodies, and they can check, they can confirm their, the experience they had. Yeah. That is more than just a dream. But certainly we know that is not a scientific proof. But even, look, to be a little bit simpler there, there is no way for us to prove love is real. There is no scientific proof of love. Mm -hmm. I challenge anyone to get a scientific proof of that. We rely on what people say, well, their reports. To, to even begin to do science on a term like love, you would need an operational definition. True, yes. We can show some uh, uh, change in our neurotransmitters yes. when people say they are in love. Mm -hmm. You can show some change of the galvanic resistance yeah. of the skin, the heartbeat, whatever. But people can have these same things under other conditions, other states. But then this love that we feel, we can't talk about it because most of the people feel or have felt love. Yeah. It's a common experience that we can share. Out about experiences can be even more objective than that. Mm -hmm. Because we can tell sometimes the same story. Mm -hmm. Two people leave the body, go to a different place, and return with the same story. Ness and I have a, a kind of experiment that we ran many times with a computer picking and presenting different images randomly out of an image bank of hundreds of images there. And a group of people in another room leaving the body, going there to see that. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the image because we have a timer. We leave the room, lock the door. We have an independent person there making sure nobody enters there. Mm -hmm. And then after three minutes, the computer puts there an image on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then in the other room, people will try to leave the body and go there. And we got so many interesting results there. Even with precognition. There was one particular session when one lady described a very nice dog with the ears up, with the tongue out. And when we checked, no image like that. Mm -hmm. But in the following session, the image was exactly like that. Yeah. What is the probability of that, of something so precise, so perfect? So if you think of the probability of any image mm -hmm. that can be presented yeah. in a computer is one over how many billions of images. So that was a very interesting result. But we have to return to that with COVID, with the pandemics, pff, a lot of things stopped for a while. So what you're saying is that uh, even though the, the training that you do, the out-of-body experiences, the energy work that you do involves a lot of subjective work, the, the goal is to find ways of objectively measuring and uh, validating to the extent possible, exactly. these experiences. If I succeed in my efforts to devise a kind of technology that can detect bioenergy, subtle energy, we can create a kind of a chamber, and people could leave the body, go there, and be detected by that. Yeah. Perhaps that equipment is not going to tell the whole story, what the, what the person thought and uh, felt or saw, but at least can show, look, yes, something got inside of this chamber and then came back. We can even see when the person leaves, so perhaps some EEG, whatever. So I think this is something that is going to be, I think, feasible, possible, is still in this lifetime, or mm -hmm. at least I hope so. Well, there have been efforts in the field of remote viewing. Yeah. For example, there's such a a thin line, it seems to me, between out-of-body experiences and remote viewing. Yes, yes. But they are very different because I had both. Yes. Because when you have remote viewing, you only have the vision of that place. Because I had yeah. situations in which I saw a scene, a place, people moving, yeah. doing whatever, but I felt inside of my body. I was inside of my body and in my mind's eye, I could see that. Yeah. When you have an out-of-body experience, you feel detaching from the body. You go there. You are present there. Mm. You are in that place. Mm. But you are right. Many times, these both things, they overlap. 
The, the research I'm thinking of, I'm pretty sure quite a bit of it was done in China. I, I'm sure there have been some efforts in the US to replicate. You have a target, a remote viewing target, and by the target, you place some undeveloped sealed photographic film. And you find in, in some of these studies that when the target is accurately described, the photographic film is also influenced. Ah, interesting. So it's a kind of measurement it's that kind of measurement. something yes. happened yes. Yes. at that location. It wasn't just observed. There is something similar. It was done during the 70s at the ASPR yes. in New York by Carly Zosis and Donna McCormick. Yes. And this was done with Alexander Tainus. They had a kind of a coffin hang, hanged there you know, yes. from the ceiling with yes. some coils to just to absorb the vibrations of the trucks passing on the street there with some... Uh, kind of detection, motion detector equipment there inside. Mm -hmm. And then Alexander had the target of getting out of the body, getting inside of that box, and a particular image was being shown, but only inside of the box. Yes. I don't remember the numbers now, but out of 200-something trials, mm -hmm. 190 times yes. he got the right image. And in some of these times, the very sensitive electronic equipment showed something there. Mm -hmm. It was more like a mechanical thing, some kind of PK. I think we can get more sensitive than that. Incidentally, yeah. we've, we've done on the New Thinking Aloud channel uh, an interview just on that research uh, with Lloyd Auerbach, who was a research assistant in, in those days and worked with Alec yes. Tannis. I'm going to have to see that one. For viewers who are curious about that, I'll link in the upper right hand corner of the screen. You can, we'll link to that video. Perfect. I'm, yeah. I will go there also. We have such a big library yes, now, yes. over a thousand videos. And this is so important. Congratulations yeah. for doing that. Some of these things, they would just disappear yeah. if you were not These bringing them back. Im important things to remember and to build upon. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And congratulations to that because that's a very important work. So many good research experiments were done yeah. and basically no one knows about that. These things disappear in you know, the clouds of it's time. such a tiny field with so many limited resources. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Wagner, what a thrill to be with you to learn about your work. I am so impressed with Thank what you, you and you Nancy much. have been doing. You spent decades building the International Academy of Consciousness and you have brought to this work something that I began to study when I was a graduate student in parapsychology. My doctoral dissertation was about training psychic abilities. Perfect. And so you, you are a trainer. Yes. You yes. have you have the mentality of a trainer and a researcher. Exactly. And and that is from my way of thinking a very, very important mindset. It is, it is. And we spend a lot of time telling people, trying to show them you don't have to be special to be born with these things. Yes. You can really develop yourself and train and have this ability. Well what a pleasure to be with you. you. So as an honor to be here with you. Thank you so much for coming to Albuquerque. My pleasure. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? We've just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.